Okay, and thank you for inviting me. Well, it's often been said that musicologists seem more interested in scores, in music as writing, than in music as performed or experienced. Musical notation and an abstruse jargon have functioned as gatekeepers keeping other disciplines at bay. But in the last decade or two, there's been a major musicological and music theoretical shift towards engaging with music as performance. And this has not only created new potential for common ground between music researchers and concert goers, it's also opened up the study of performance, uh, the study of music to other disciplines. In fact, as they've moved towards deeper engagement with performance, musicologists and theorists have sometimes found themselves chasing other disciplines that have already moved into the study of music as performance. Researchers in interdisciplinary performance studies, by which I mean theatre, dance, cultural studies, gave up on musicologists quite some time ago, and the increasingly common term music as performance actually emanates from theatre studies. Researchers in popular cultural studies forged ahead with a study of both live and recorded performances. Performance is also a central topic within ethnomusicology, and the dividing lines between musicology and ethnomusicology have become progressively more blurred as musicologists have adapted ethnomusicological techniques such as participant observation in working on performance. But these kinds of cross-disciplinary alliance have also been a feature of the harder end of empirical research into classical music performance. And here I'm talking about music psychology, of course, which is where quantitative work on music performance began before jumping the discipline gap to music theory. I'm also talking about computer science, which has given rise to a wide range of approaches. You might see empirical musicology and MIR, music information retrieval, as parallel fields, each born out of the conjunction of musicology and computer science, but approached in terms of totally different disciplinary aims and assumptions. Now, Bernard Shaw once talked about Britain and America being separated by a common language, and something similar can be said of interdisciplinary research. Misunderstandings arise when researchers from different disciplines work on the same area, apparently talking about the same things, but on the basis of different assumptions or with different ends in view. And that's the kind of unstructured leakage between disciplines that Eric Clark warned against long ago in his article, Mind the Gap. Oh yes, now what's happened here? Okay, there we go. Mind the Gap. Indeed, such misunderstandings can occur within disciplines that encompass a range of epistemological positions, such as music theory, which, as the work of Fred Lerdahl demonstrates, goes all the way from evidence-based research to compositional advocacy. And if one's never quite sure whether one stops and the other starts, that might be said to be one of the characteristic and indeed creative traits of music theory. At other times, epistemological asymmetry can be no problem at all. At least in my experience, collaboration between musicologists or theorists and MIR researchers is very easy once they've figured out that they're engaged in different enterprises because MIR researchers want musicological data as fuel for testing their theories and musicologists want analytical tools in exchange, so it's a kind of win-win relationship. Another, I think, positive example is a research project which I worked on with Eric Clark, with the pianist Philip Thomas and the composer Bryn Harrison. We were interested in how accurately Philip played Bryn's Etreton. We were interested in how uh, Philip played uh, Bryn's uh, Etreton, including the issues of accuracy. Etreton is a new complexity sort of score that bristles with nested irrational rhythms. And the quantitative data looked very unpromising. In other words, it looked like you know, the pianist was just bluffing his way through until we talked to Philip and realized that he'd rehearsed the music. He thought of the music rather like Bach counterpoint, working on each line individually and then working to put them together. Once we re-ran the analysis that way, we discovered that Philip performed the rhythms extremely accurately, and actually he'd done so almost since the first time he played, the stu played it through. He, this is the music that he specializes on. So an ethnographical approach provided the context for quantitative analysis, and it helped us to avoid an analysis 
which would have been mathematically right, but musically wrong. So in this way, one methodological approach can locate or highlight weaknesses, omissions, or blind spots in another. It can open up interpretive options that unquestioned disciplinary assumptions have closed off. And I'm going to illustrate this at greater length by talking about the way in which close analysis of recordings can open up a dimension to which both music theory and music psychology are insensitive, which is that of historical change. More specifically, I'm going to talk about a couple of pieces of work that I carried out within CHARM, the AHRC Research Centre for the History and Analysis of Recorded Music, which I directed during the five years of its existence, from 2004 to 2009. And it was actually the predecessor. It was the Phase I Centre, of which the Phase II Centre is the less happily acronym CMPCP, uh, the AHRC Research Centre for Musical Performance's Creative Practice, which is hosted at the University of Cambridge and is going on right now. So, plug over. Okay, well, the first piece of work that I want to talk about that I carried out at Sharm has to do with music theory, the basic approach of which is synchronic rather than diachronic. And that's a focus that gives music theory analytical strength, but generally comes with a certain blindness to context. And a case in point is Shankarian uh, performance pedagogy, an approach to practical performance teaching that is quite widespread in North American academia based on the theories of the Viennese musician, editor, and pedagogue Heinrich Schenker, as expounded and developed in post-war North America by Schenker's disciples and his disciples' disciples. Now, the historical as well as geographical dimension of this approach, the fact that it's derived from fin de siècle Vienna, is something that is hardly at all, uh, hardly if at all, discussed within this pedagogical tradition, uh, where the Schenkerian approach is simply presented as the way to create fully adequate performances where adequacy means that an analytical understanding based on Schenkerian principles is translated into performance practice. So, in effect, the assumption is that what I would call the structural or structuralist uh, performance, uh, sorry, uh, in effect, the assumption is that what I would call structural or structuralist performance is a paradigm for what performance is, for what performance should be, and how it should be understood. And now the interesting thing to me anyhow is that the kind of performance that Shankirian pedagogues advocate is as different as it could possibly be from the kind of performance that Schenker was familiar with in pre-war Vienna. Schenker was by repute a fine pianist, especially an accompanist, but he never made any recordings. They talked about it, but it never happened. However, we can hear some recordings by pianists of Schenker's time that Schenker admired. And one such performer was the pianist, uh, really should be Eugen, he changed his name from Eugène to Eugen, Eugen Dalbert, who in 1905 made a Welt Mignon piano roll of Schubert's impromptu op 90 number three. Okay, now I'm just going to play you the beginning of it and I'd like you to listen for how Dalbert slows down, creates space, lingers, or delays the passage of time in this music. getting slower and slower. Now rushing. So he rushes across the break into the next phrase. Huge prolongation on the appoggiatura. This time he doesn't pause, uh, prolong that because he's moving on to here. Now, Schenkerian theory can be characterized 
as top-down. Large-scale structural units, such as phrases or prolongational spans, are identified, and smaller details are interpreted in relation to those larger units, with interpretation being understood equally in the senses of analysis and of performance. But on this piano roll, Delbert's playing seems to work the other way round, as it were, from the bottom up. So individual notes are selected for expressive emphasis. You heard his huge lingerings over various sort of key notes, expressive notes in the middle of phrases. Uh, and he creates expressive emphasis by progressively decelerating, getting slower and slower as if trudging to the top of a hill as he approaches them, lingers on them, and then sort of freewheels downhill. Uh, and as he accelerates away from them downhill, quite often he rushes through phrase breaks, you know, rather than separating the phrases, he, he rushes through from one to the next, sort of swallowing the notes, as it were. And the result is a constantly changing tempo that might be described as a breathing-like alternation of inhalation and exhalation. Modern critics, however, have generally seen Dalbert's style of performance as erratic or eccentric, and that's not surprising since it's thoroughly at variance with present-day performance practice. Even the unnamed author of the liner notes on the Dalsenio transfer of Op 93, who, after all, you might have expected to be on Dalbert's side, refers to his strange rhythmic lapses. And you get a lot of talk about how the, there must have been something wrong with the recording machines uh, when people like Dalbert and Reinecke made roles. Well, in that case, they were wrong on all the machines they recorded on, even when they came from different firms. That's actually how they played. So there was a fundamentally different sense of the use of time. Um, in a nutshell, I would say modernist performance regards music as something that happens in time. This old school performance from the turn of the century regards time as a dimension of performance, so that as the music gets denser or gets more uh, expressively intense, slow, so time takes longer to happen, and the result is this constantly fluctuating tempo that ever since then has been attacked at these people just couldn't play in time. <coughs> now, in 1924, Schenker published an analytical article on this impromptu, and it's arguably the first example of Schenkerian analysis in the fully developed form that we're used to nowadays. So you get the familiar graph and commentary in five levels, um, you know, with the, the commentary on each level. I mean, this is the, the format that then Schenker, having developed, it used again and again. And as well as these, Schenker included a close bar-by-bar -bar description of op how Op 93 should be played. And indeed, most of Schenker's articles include such descriptions in detail how the music should be played but Schenkerian analysts almost completely ignore them because they can't make sense of them. Now, it's basically impossible to find any points of contact between Schenker's description of how the music should go and his graph. The shaping that Schenker prescribes, the points that he identifies for expressive emphasis, just don't map onto the Schenkerian structure. But, the things that Schenker says about how the piece should be played do have a lot to do with Dalbert's performance. It's not that Dalbert does everything that Schenker says. I mean, that would be ridiculous, of course not. But it's that Schenker is describing the same sort of playing that Dalbert's role exemplifies. It's like two people expressing different points of view, but doing so in a common language. By contrast, the kind of structuralist performance that present-day Shankarian pedagogy advocates, uh, that essentially we take for granted nowadays, is in quite fundamental ways a different language of performance. In short, Schenker's analytical theory was appropriated to rationalize or legitimize a structuralist style of performance, a product of post-war modernism, that is almost diametrically opposed to Schenker's own sense of how music should go. The structuralist approach was erected into a kind of universal principle governing performance, a timeless paradigm of what good performance should be. But to think that is to ignore history. The mainstream performance of the post-war period was simply a historical style like any other. Now, 
though I used a software study environment to do that piece of work, uh, of which there's a whole lot more, um, it really didn't require much more than old-fashioned close listening. I mean, the significant thing is, is simply that no Schenkerian had thought to do it before. Um, but there is obviously scope for musicological work, and in a sense that's the word I want to underline, musicological work on recordings that draws much more heavily on technology, and that's what I want to talk about for my, my second and much longer example. This focuses around the issue of phrase arching in the performance of classical music, especially in 19th century piano music, such as Chopin's, where you get louder and faster as you play into a phrase, and softer and slower as you come out of it. But better than describing it, it is playing an example of what I'm talking about. So here is the beginning of Chopin's Mazurka op 63, number three, as performed by the Russian pianist Grigory Sokolov. Okay, picking up speed. Picking up speed again <coughs> and slowing down. Okay, all very familiar now. Here my starting point is not music theory, but psychology. Because in the 1980s, the music psychologist Neil Todd developed a model of expressive performance based on the idea that performers give temporal and dynamic shaping to musical phrases through the use of parabolic functions applied at multiple levels, such as two, four, eight, 16 bar units, and with the overall tempo profile resulting from adding all of those together. And his theory was generally well received, although most regard researchers regarded it as one component of performance expression rather than, as Todd presented it, its essential characteristic. Todd recognised for sure that tempo and dynamics are not always coupled this way, but he suggested that it represents, quote, a kind of normative default mode of performance. And he also proposed an explanation for this. Tempo and dynamics work together this way, he suggested, because they together express a unified percept of self-motion. And that, he said, is why phrase arching sounds so natural. His 1985 article was actually based on laboratory performances by four pianists, but he expressed its results as having much more general validity than that might suggest. For example, when he wrote that the performer uses phrase final lengthening as a device to reflect some underlying structure abstracted from the musical surface. So I'm talking about that generalized sense of the performer. It's rather like the listener in music analysis, music theory. So I think it's hard to read that as anything but a general characterization of the qualities of musical performance. Now, okay, I, I basically regard myself as a you know, card-carrying cultural musicologist, more or less, and card-carrying mu cultural musicologists are brought up to view that kind of quasi-universal principle with suspicion, especially when they involve making a link between value judgment and the N-word nature. In fact, the standard musicological response to this would be to argue that such a link cannot possibly exist because of the extent to which values are culturally constructed, historically contingent, and subject to negotiation. But we can go beyond that kind of argument in principle, because this is an area where it's perfectly easy to go out, collect some data, and get a result. We've got a century's worth of sound recordings, and even allowing for the many potential confounds involved in the use of recordings as evidence of performance practice, and you know, we can talk about that for two hours, even allowing for that, 
record, recordings still provide indispensable evidence of historical changes in musical interpretation. So in the second project I carried out within Charm in collaboration with Craig Sapp, I analyzed 52 recordings of Chopin's Mazurka Op 63 number no. 3, the one you just heard the opening of. Um, we extracted beaten global dynamic data, and our aim was to develop a way of modeling the practice of phrase arching that would make it possible to trace this historical development, or trace its historical development. I published an abridged version of this work, so I don't want to, don't want to spend too long on it, but briefly, it's based on two visualizations. Um, the first is what uh, Craig and I called an arch combiscape, and it, it measures the extent to which tempo and dynamics correlate with a rising or falling arch shape. Uh, not too bad. Doesn't usually look, always looks better than my screen than on the data projection, but it's not so bad this time. So the figure consists of two triangles, the upper one representing tempo, the lower one dynamics, with time on the, uh, on the horizontal axis, so we're simply going through the piece like that. The yellow-orange flames show matches with rising arches, the blue flames show matches with falling arches. So a complete arch profile um, would be shown by the combination of first an orange and then a blue flame. And the height of the patches give you a sort of indication of the length of the arch, whether it's four bars, eight bars, whatever. So here, in Pachmann's 1927 recording of Op 63, number 3, you can see well-formed phrase arching in dynamics. Okay? At the bottom, you've got uh, patternings of orange, yellow, and blue phrases. You know, pr pretty nice and neat. Um, the arches constantly fall a little bit later than the composed phrasing, and that's a fairly general characteristic. However, you can't really see that going on in tempo at all to any clear degree. So he's handling dynamics very much according to the principle of phrase arching, but not tempo. The same kind of plot for Rachmaninoff's 1923 recording shows the reverse. There's pretty well formed tempo arching, um, but there's little dynamic arching, and also the arching that there is there is out of kilter with the, it's out of phase with the composed phrasing. So we've sort of got elements of phrase arching here, but they're not, as it were, put together. There are also other recordings in which there's little evidence of phrase arching at all. This is Friedman's recording, also from 1923, which is characterized by a huge amount of very small-scale tempo inflection and accentuation, the sort of same thing you heard in the Dalbert, but on a much smaller kind of scale, is what I recall the, call the rhetorical style of performance, but there's, you know, there's no significant degree of phrase arching. At the opposite end of the scale, and dating from some 30 years later, is Neuhaus's 1955 recording. So you can see there's lots of both tempo and dynamic arching, and the bilateral symmetry between the tempo and the dynamics between the two halves of the diagram shows you what a high degree of coordination there is between them. It's really two dimensions of a single gestural characterization. So Neuhaus is using, and it's locked into the phrase, the composed phrasing. So Neuhaus is using tempo and dynamics together to communicate the regular phrasing structure of the music and this becomes the, the principal locus of expression in his performance. There's not really very much happening on the note-to-note -note level, but there's these huge, slow, expressive oscillations, and that's really where the expressive focus of the performance is. So looking at these, and but some more of them, the story suggested is that elements of phrase arching existed in recordings from before the Second World War, but that fully coordinated phrase arching of the Todd type with tempo dynamics and the composed phrasing all locked together emerged just after the Second World War. Here's Sokolov's recording. It doesn't make quite such a neat pattern as Neuhaus's, but you can see that it belongs very much within the same performance tradition. So the point of these visualizations is to show at a glance how tempo and dynamics work together. 
and to make comparison between different pianists easy. But of course, any visualization can only tell you so much. And in these combiscapes, phrase arching at the eight bar level is so strong that it's hard to see what's going on at any other level. So, um, as Todd's model has to do with phrase arching occurring at multiple levels, we developed an alternative visualization that's based on the same algorithm. You know, the, the, the motor behind it is the same, but now we implemented it as uh, an Excel spreadsheet. And here, the extent of tempo and dynamic phrasing at each level, 2, 4, and 16 bars, is shown separately. OK, that's the bar graphs. So that you can see that while both Neuhaus and Sokolov are using phrase arching at the 8 bar level, Sokolov is actually closer to the Todd model in that he's using it at multiple levels, not just the 8 bar level, particularly um, strongly uh, at the 16 bar level compared to most pianists. But there's also another important piece of information in the graph, which fortunately you can see with some data projectors you can't. And that's the yellow line graph, because that shows the degree of correlation between tempo and dynamic arching. In, fact, in other words, how far are tempo and dynamics locked together, working, as it were, as different dimensions of a single parameter. So the scale on the right goes with this, with zero signifying no correlation and one signifying identity. And you can see from that that at the 8 and especially the 16 bar level, Sokolov locks his tempo and dynamics much more closely than does Neuhaus. Well, with the information contained in these graphs and lots more of them, we were able to combine and weight these separate factors into a single composite formula, which we used as a rough overall measure of phrase arching, a, a kind of rule of thumb. And on the basis of that, we created a scattergram with the strength of phrase arching. So highest uh, at the top means uh, more phrase arching, at the bottom less phrase arching, plotted, as you can see, against the date of the recording. Uh, and you can see how the strongest phrase arching does indeed emerge in the aftermath of the Second World War. Here it suddenly is. I mean, here there's an area which simply isn't populated until then. One interesting finding is that the three performers, of whom we have multiple recordings, and that's Friedman and Juninsky and Rubinstein, all of them come out with rather consistent overall values, even though when you look at the detail of the individual profiles of their recordings, they actually vary quite a lot. So it seems as if they're trying to achieve similar levels of phrase arching in their different recordings, even though they do so in different ways. Another finding is the extent to which phrase arching tends to be associated with Russian or Russian-trained pianists. Not wholly, as you can see, though so the Russians are uh, represented by the squares. 70% of the Russians fall into the top half of, figure, uh, of this diagram, as against 40% of the others. Finally, the scattergram not only confirms the historical pattern I just mentioned, but it shows something equally important, which is that while highly coordinated phrase arching did emerge after the war, performances that didn't feature that kind of phrase arching continued. They continue right throughout. They didn't stop. I'll just add in one thing, by the way, which is that if you plot the same data, not using the date of recording, but using date of birth of the pianist, you get a complete mess. That's interesting because it's generally assumed that pianists fix their style you know, in their late teens, and with a few exceptions, such as Rubenstein, stick to that, rather than being affected by changing fashions. It seems to me this shows that, that phrase arching was much more like a changing fashion. Not everybody signed up to it, but then that applies to any fashions. OK, now what more general conclusions might we draw from this little study? First, going back to where we came from, it's obvious that the practice of phrase arching is very much subject to historical change. Even if it has natural underpinnings, as Todd suggests, there is evidently a great deal of cultural elaboration going on. Or to put it another way, 
if this is indeed a measure of musical performance, then the sense of the musical is historically contingent, just like any musicologist would wish to believe. A second point follows on this. The fact that Todd-style phrase arching became an available option after the Second World War, but that a substantial number of performers didn't adopt it, shows that stylistic change is not the impersonal force as which musicologists often represent it. You know, when you get style histories of music and individuals are kind of edited out of it as if music history was driven by these impersonal forces sort of standing somewhere behind real people. Individual performers clearly chose to play one way or another from the options that were available to them. So they exercised their ability to make choices. And in that respect, at least they acted as free agents. Third, it's become received wisdom in musicological studies of performance history that there's a constant trend towards a standardization of performance, towards convergence on a limited number of stylistic options probably as a result of recordings. Now, the sources of this narrative of music history, of performance history, lie in the pessimistic cultural critique of the Adorno tradition. Music shows us what is happening in society at large with the ever-growing bureaucratization of everyday life and the cultural grey out brought about by global capitalism, etc., etc., etc. But as you can see, empirical analysis of these recordings of Op 63, number three, actually gives very little evidence of such a trend. And other recent researchers in the area of historical performance studies tend to come to similar conclusions. The evidence for the great pessimistic myth of standardization and convergence isn't necessarily there. No, th th this grand narrative of star standardization and decline obviously has a kind of, you know, mythical or mythologizing kind of attraction. You know, it has legs. Um, but that's not the only reason it came into being. It's also because of two problems connected with more traditional musicological approaches to analyzing recordings, which generally involved a CD player, a score, a pencil, and maybe a stopwatch. That's how it was done 30 years ago, insofar as it was done at all. The first problem is that the musical ear, while highly sensitive and flexible, is also highly malleable. There's a tendency to hear what you expect to hear. That means that quantitative data can provide a means of cutting through what can otherwise become a vicious cycle of interpretation. And I think that's what's going on with the narrative of decline story. The other problem is that because close listening is a laborious and time-consuming process, and it's very difficult to remember what you heard 10 minutes ago, this means that traditional, purely listening-based narratives are necessarily based on the use of a limited number of representative examples. But that poses an obvious difficulty, because unless you've studied everything, how can you know what is examples are representative, or indeed what they're representative of? And I think my study of Op 63, number three, provides a case in point. Because without the empirical data for all 52 recordings, I would have focused my study on those that contributed to my narrative, okay? The recordings from the 1920s that either don't feature phrase arching, such as Friedman's, or that feature it in tempo or dynamics, but not both, like Rachmaninoff and Pachmann. Then I would have talked about the streamlined interpretations of the immediate post-war period that do f feature fully coordinated Todd-style phrase arching. I talked about Neuhaus's, but I would also talk about Ch Cheney Stefanska's, which came, comes right after the Second World War, and suddenly, bang, here is the new style. And she promptly wins the, 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 the Warsaw Chopin piano competition, which incidentally, you could also tell this story through the eyes of that competition and its judges. And then the story would continue, you know, very nicely, um, to the continuing performance tradition represented, in particular by Russian pianists such as, well, Sokolov, but also Gornosteva, also Ashkenazi, and so on and so forth. It would be absolutely great. But it would also be quite misleading because that story would ignore what doesn't fit in with this nice story, and that's all those recordings from all periods that 
don't fit in, that don't do phrase arching, that just continue the same as if nothing had happened. And I think you can actually make a case that you know, the grand narratives of performance style that are now appearing, including the pessimistic uh, myth of decline, however appealing they are, I think these grand narratives are likely to be premature until there's sufficient data, you know, sufficient slog done to justify the belief that there actually is such a thing as performance style at all in the sense of something that applies across different um, uh, genres, different uh, music performed by different instrumental or vocal forces. Maybe each of those have their own histories. Maybe some individual pieces have their own histories. How far is there such a thing as the performance style even of Western classical music at a kind of, you know, supra level? I think it's just far too early to know, you know? And that, in a way, these appealing theories will continue to be premature until we've actually done the hard work and got the facts. So I would say that for the time being, the jury is out on this quite fundamental question of in what sense is there such a thing as performance style as a historical entity. Now, it has to be said that this kind of empirical work on recordings has not been universally welcomed by musicologists. In other words, I've got some flack. And it's been criticised on a number of grounds, some of which I think are reasonable and some of which I don't think are reasonable. One objection is that if traditional musicology has tended to focus on scores rather than performances or experiences, then this kind of empirical analysis represents a new kind of textualism with the same shortcomings as the old. The old analysis uh, analyzed notations, the new analysis analyzes all these wiggles, the music, the experience goes out the window. So recordings are taken out of context and analysed as self-sufficient objects rather than as the traces of human actions in specific social and cultural situations. Robert Philip, who basically kicked off you know, the analysis of recordings as a major thread within uh, Western music history, Robert Philip points out how in extracting features from recordings, empirical analysis can leave behind essential aspects of the phenomenon supposedly under investigation. So he says, a computer can measure accelerations and decelerations, but to the listener, these have quite different qualities. An acceleration can seem impulsive or uncontrolled. It can seem to be aiming precisely at a target or to be dangerously wild. It can seem spontaneous or calculating. A deceleration can seem sluggish, calming, boring, cumulative, climactic. You can't easily measure such qualities, but they are what create the narrative of events. Simply measuring tempo is only a starting point for understanding these things. Now, uh, I'd entirely agree. I think most people working in empirical musicology would absolutely agree with that final point. But the fact is that early work in this field did tend to you know, extract and analyze data, give you some wiggles, and essentially leave it at that without going back in any useful manner to the experience of the music. And the reason was that at that time, it was very difficult to connect these graphs with the musical sound. So you started with the musical sound and the experience, you extracted the graph from it, but it was sort of almost impossible to put the, the, them back together. With the development of more sophisticated software for working with recordings, however, such as Sonic Visualizer, tempo graphs and other analytical visualizations can be incorporated into the playback environment. And that makes it much easier to link analytical representation with oral experience, to, to literally hear what you're talking about. It makes the whole process musically real in a way that it didn't used to be. Or to borrow Philip's terms, it makes it possible for the analyst to link measurements with qualities. So heightening perceptions, guarding against the ear's tendency to hear what it expects to hear, and making it far easier to discuss details of performance with other people. And if you want a musicology, you've got to find ways of talking about what is going on. I think that that also suggests a response to some of the more sweeping objections that have been made against this kind of work. 
So I'm talking, for example, about Richard Taruskin, who is actually targeting all music analysis, score-based as much as performance-based, when he complains that turning ideas into objects and putting objects in place of people is the essential modernist fallacy, the fallacy of reification. It fosters the further fallacy of forgetting that performances, even canned performances, are not things but acts. Now, I think what Taruskin overlooks when he says this is that the function of musical analysis, and this applies whether it's Schenkerian voice leading reductions or tempographs, the function of music analysis is to prompt the kind of close analytical listening that I was just describing. In this way, analyses like performances are themselves not things but acts. And I think a similar response might be made also to the even more sweeping objections of Carolyn Abati, who claims that the experience of live performance is the only authentic musical reality and hence the only valid subject for musicology. According to her voice leading graph scores and even recordings, all of which she calls the tactile monuments of music's necropolis, I mean, she has a way with words, you must say, uh, all of these are no more than ciphers of you know, the primordial experience of music. Uh, so voice leading graph scores are employed by musicologists to distance and to domesticate an experience that is inherently uncanny, unruly, uh, ultimately irreconcilable with verbal expression, irreconcilable with musicology. Um, in a way, I don't know where that gets you, and I think what Abati overlooks is the sense in which, unlike cons conservators or hi historians of technology, musicologists don't actually study recordings as such. What they study are the performances, in other words, the acts which the recordings represent. And when I say represent, I'm being careful because in talking about performances in that context, I'm equally talking about actual performances of which the recordings are the trace, or virtual performances that were created through digital studio technology. I'm also tempted to add, although I should probably think better of it, that as with Taruskin's sneering reference to canned performances, these critiques perpetuate an elitist tradition of disparaging mechanically reproduced music, which is the same music as experienced by practically everybody in today's world. Uh, that's a, a, an elitist tradition that goes back almost as far as the technology itself. So actually, I think there's something very reactionary about that kind of critique. But the question still remains as to whether objective measurements and computational analyses can contribute in any substantive way to the kind of understanding of music at which musicologists aim, which focuses on such areas as personal experience, social context, cultural meaning. Well, I mean, I'd obviously say yes, and to make my case, I'll return to Chopin's Mazurka Op 63, number three, but now I'm going to supplement what I said before with the evidence of performance context that's provided in however partial or mediated the basis by video recordings. So, earlier I played you the beginning of Sokolov's recording of this mazurka. Well, I actually took it from the DVD of a concert at which he played it on the 4th of November 2002 at the Théâtre des Champs-Élysées in Paris, where it was the first of five encores. On course. Bruno Monsignor, the director of the DVD, writes in the liner notes that at the start of the concert, suddenly a massive shadow appears who moves swiftly over to the keyboard, the only brightly lit surface to stand out from the large coffin like box at the center of the stage. And this sense of the massive, almost Russian bear like form with the fluid movements and the delicate touch, I think is part of the experience that you carry away from the performance. So, Here's what you heard before, but now you'll see it too. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay, well, somebody ripped this track to YouTube where many viewers posted complimentary comments until it was taken down after a complaint from the copyright owner. But one of the few negative postings had to do with the way that Sokolov's hands fly up as he play, after he plays certain notes, sort of rather like a marionette. And I'll let you read this comment for yourself. A more positive way to make the same point would be that Sokolov uses visible gesture to make musical points. He sways as he plays, he alters his posture in a manner that is at least partly coordinated with the music, but it goes further than that. He creates accents through dynamic or agogic emphasis or through articulation, as all pianists do, but he also does it by means of the quit hands gesture. As you saw, his right hand flies up as soon as he has attacked the note, clipping it visually, and so throwing weight onto the following note. Again, he shapes notes after he's played them. On the first right-hand note of bar seven, for example, he keeps his finger on the depressed T key while he twists his palm to the right and back again, and that lends it a visual quality of sustained shaping that is cross-domain mapped to the auditory sphere. So that the effect of sound and sight working together in this way is to create a lyrical effect that is nonetheless real, nonetheless musical for not being present in an audio-only recording. And within this performance, Sokolov is fairly consistent in his use of these gestures. When sections repeat, he usually, though not always, repeats the gestures, just as he usually, but not always, repeats the nuances of tempo dynamics and articulation. So I think you can say that physical gesture is an integral dimension of his interpretation of a piece like this. Watching Sokolov, it becomes clear how little a performance gesture is determined by the mechanics of keyboard performance, and in consequence, how much is freely available for shaping and giving meaning to the music in performance. It stands to reason, then, that other performers represented in videos of this piece that I found on YouTube deploy gesture to create very different kinds of effects. And I'll briefly talk about just two. One is from a solo recital given at the Manners College of Music in New York in January 2008. And the performer is Irina Moratsova, who teaches in the college's preparatory division. While Moratsova has her own repertory of expressive gesture, the predominant quality of her performance is a detached, almost dreamlike quality that she creates both through touch and tempo and by the way that she lifts, lifts her gaze up, upwards at particularly expressive points. And that, of course, is an established signifier of the sublime that you can find on any number of record sleeves. OK, so here she is. Then, quite different, is a performance by Julien Duchoud, which was given at, uh, in June 2007 at the Chateau de Repaille in Haute-Savoie. So let's have a quick look at that. For some reason, it's got clipped off at the end in a rather ugly way. Um, um. An audience member posted a comment, again, on the YouTube we tube website. It was a wonderful concert in the old French castle. The public was touched by emotions. No one seemed to be indifferent. Everyone could appreciate such a splendid, sensual, and bright playing. Chopin's Mazurka sounded very nostalgically, and its Polish motifs were performed with special skill by this young pianist. And the intimacy of the occasion can be both seen and heard on the video. As you saw, the audience sits close to the pianist who plays from the music, something that immediately separates him from the virtuoso tradition in which memorization is de rigueur. The room is dimly lit, but an ordinary desk lamp placed on the piano throws a pool of light on the music. And 
perhaps because Dushu is playing from the music rather than rehearsing an uh, overlearned sequence of actions, his performance is marked by a freedom and tempo that gives it a quality of extemporization. You have the impression, which may be completely incorrect, but you have the impression that he might play the music quite differently if the audience reacted differently. This further serves to bind players, uh, player and listeners into the shared temporality of the occasion and in this way strengthen the sense of community that is reflected in that YouTube posting. And this is the point where empirical analysis of phrase arching comes into play. Here's the chart you saw before, but now with Sokolov's, Moritzovas and Dushud's performances picked out, and you can see that they appear in quite different positions. Dushu makes very little use of the kind of coordinating phrase arching described by Todd. Detailed analysis shows that there are some elements of both tempo and dynamic phrase arching in his playing, but they're not at all closely coordinated with one another. And in that respect, Dushud's playing might be compared with that of early 20th century pianists such as Friedman, whose recordings convey, I think to an even greater extent than Dushud's, a quality of gestural immediacy, a sense that the music is being unfolded unpredictably from moment to moment, as if the shared temporality that I referred to is being generated on the fly in the course of performance. By contrast, Moritzova and Sokolov both exemplify the Russian tradition of phrase arching, and as it happens, both trained at the St. Petersburg Conservatory. And this links with immediately perceptible aspects of their performance. I referred to the detached quality of Morosova's playing, relating it to the way she lifts her gaze at expressive points, but of course it's, in, it's inherent in the sound too. The effect of the phrase arching is to relocate the locus of expression, transferring it from the evolving moment-to-moment -moment course of performance that was so important in Dushu's playing to the larger, more architectonic, more, if you like, remote level of phrase structure. That gives a sense of formality to the occasion. It creates a separation of performer and audience even within the modest dimensions of the Manus College Recital Hall. With Sokolov, it goes further, much further. He is, of course, playing in a much larger space than either Dushu or Moritzova. But public performance in the virtuoso tradition is encoded into the very fabric of Sokolov's playing. In oral as well as physical terms, the space between him and the audience becomes an unbridgeable gulf. You might liken it to the performance, you, you might liken the performance to a celebration of the Eucharist scene from afar in a grand cathedral, or you might think of an acrobatic display in the big top, but either way it's hard to imagine audience reaction having any impact on Sokolov's interpretation, because he's giving a show. He's giving a show he's no doubt given on many previous occasions, and do remember this is an encore. And phrase arching, of which the chart shows Sokolov to be quite an extreme exponent, lies at the heart of this. The slow, predictable oscillation of tempo and dynamics, synchronized with one another and with the formal patterning of the music, creates an immensely strong framework for the performance. It's the over-engineered scaffolding which supports the gorgeous drapery of Sokolov's extraordinarily extravagant performance, a performance which brings to the concert hall a choreography that's hardly less intricate in its conception and hardly less finely honed in its execution than you might see at the ballet. Empirical analysis, in short, helps to clarify the mechanism underlying the immediately perceptible effect of Sokolov's performance, and at the same time, it sets Sokolov's performance into the context of the very different performances that other performers at different times and places have fashioned out of the same music. But I would also maintain that the kind of information generated through empirical analysis, the stuff that I've been talking about, can itself become the raw material for musicological analysis that penetrates deep into cultural values. So, keeping in mind this chart of the historical development of phrase arching and recordings of Op 63, number 3, 
I'd like to briefly explore some of the broader cultural dimensions of this changing historical practice. I see Todd Starr phrase arching as an expression of the international modernism that developed across the arts in two successive thrusts before and after the Second World War. I see it as comparable, for example, to the sans serif fonts that came into prominence at just the same time. Gil Sans, which dates from the early 1930s, and its post-war successor, Univer, from the mid-1950s, they both share the uncluttered organicism that you find in fully coordinated phrase arching. So I think you might compare this phrase arching practice to the modernist interior design movement that drove out antimacassars and knickknacks. But I'm going to trace a rather more elaborate analogy with modernist architecture. It was in 1923, the same year Rachmaninoff and Friedman made their recordings of Op 63 number 3, that the original French version of Le Corbusier's Towards a New Architecture was published. The first illustration in the main part of the book is a photograph of a compression arch bridge built by Eiffel, it's the Pont de Gariby. And one of the last is an aircraft hangar. Then there's a chapter entitled Eyes Which Do Not See, which provocatively juxtaposes images of aerodynamically designed racing cars with the Parthenon. Now, the context here, of course, is anti-expressivism, the machine aesthetic. But, as in music, so here we see the elements of an expressive synthesis that didn't develop until after the war when an affinity becomes evident between modernist phrase arching on one hand and on the other hand the modernist religiosity of Corbusier's chapel of Notre Dame de Haute at Rochon, which many would describe as the most spiritual of all his buildings. And it was completed in 1955, the same year that Neuhaus recorded Op 63 number 3. Well, in drawing this comparison, I mean something a bit more than the coincidence of art shaping and musical performance and engineering, or the general ubiquity of streamlined forms, or even the polemical association of such streamlined forms with the classics, whether architectural or musical. Le Corbusier justified the basing of architecture on such design elements in terms of both function and perception, and he attacked the art historical conception of style. Both Le Corbusier and other modernist, European modernist architects, however, were criticised by Buckminster Fuller as themselves no more than stylists. The international style simplification was but superficial. It peeled off yesterday's exterior embellishment and put on instead formalised novelties of quasi-simplicity. It was still a European garmentation. Now, Fuller's point was that, with the exception perhaps of the cantilever principle made possible by the tensile properties of reinforced concrete, otherwise the European modernists engineered their buildings round the post and beam design elements that went back to early traditions of timber building. The straight lines of conventional architecture, he argued, embody the same kind of flat earth thinking, uh, embody a kind of flat earth thinking that is as unnatural as it is obsolete, for in nature all the lines are completely curved. Uh, and that explains my earlier reference to organicism. Instead, and in the, the traditional 19th century engineers like Eugène Viollet-le-Duc, Fuller advocated structures based on curved members in compression and the use of shells, and he applied the same design principles to cars, that's the second of Fuller's Dymaxion cars. That's the third, by the way, which was owned by Stokowski until he got rid of it because he just thought it was too bloody dangerous. <laughs> he applied it to houses, and of course he applied it to his most famous invention, the ge geodesic dome, with its ability to encompass unprecedented spans. In all of these works, curved, streamlined forms become the elements of a new design conception that embraced both engineering and aesthetics. Now, 
again, I don't mean to suggest any relationship of mutual knowledge or influence between the European musicians of the mid-century and Fuller, who was at that time relatively little known even in America. The point is rather, if you like, a, a formal one. The thinking behind Fuller's designs translates to music through the contrast between the linear organization of rhetorical performance, which is in effect a series of expressive accents or spot loads, and on the other hand, fully coordinated phrase arching in which each element is integrated within an encompassing architectonic structure. So whereas Friedman's playing can be understood as a series of expressive moments, phrase arching transferred the locus of expression from the individual moment to the shaped temporal envelope, and in this way, it created an extended span of, re of expectation and realization. That resonates with what I said in relation to Moritz Sova about the effect of phrase arching being to relocate expression to the larger, more architectonic level of phrase structure. But more important still, it means that expression was no longer something just subjective, personal and attribute of the individual performer, as in the case of Friedman, instead it became an attribute of the music. And that's where I locate the most direct link between modernism and performance practice. The movement of Neue Sachlichkeit, or new objectivity, was one of a succession of artistic fads in Europe between the wars, in large part a reaction against the perceived excesses of German expressionism. In music, however, the values of objectivity took a hold that they never had in the other arts. Uh, and they solidified into an aesthetic that was hardly questioned in the world of classical performance throughout the rest of the 20th century, at least until historically, performed, perfor historically informed performance came along to make it clear that there were alternatives. In his enormously influential writings, and in a way I think they were more influential than his music, Stravinsky inveighed against expressive interpretation, insisting that the performer's job was execution, that is, carrying out exactly what the composer had specified. Then another modernist performer, the conductor Arturo Toscanini, had his own slogan, come scritto, as it is written. The only thing is that you can't play classical music as it's written with every quarter note the same length and exactly twice the length of an eighth, and even if you could, you wouldn't want to. As has been evident ever since the invention of MIDI, classical music without expressive nuance is barely recognizable as music, certainly if it's something like Chopin's Mazurkas. So, on the one hand, traditional practices of rhetorical playing, as exemplified by Friedman, had come to seem both cluttered and overly personal in the world of 20th century mo modernism. They were cluttered like the antimacassas and knickknacks. They were hopelessly self-indulgent. On the other hand, Stravinsky's and Toscanini's slogans were, well, just that, slogans. They couldn't be taken literally as prescriptions for performance. Fully coordinated phrase arching, Todd-style phrase arching as it developed in the aftermath of the war squared the circle. It didn't eliminate the old codes, uh, the codes of expressive performance, but instead it regularized or regulated, rationalized them. By coordinating tempo and dynamics with one another and with the composed phrase arching, it created a structure that was expressive enough to be meaningful even when played with little inflection from one note to the next. But, and this is the critical point, the expressivity was no longer the direct expression of artistic personality. It could now be seen as drawn directly from the musical structure, and in that way, an expression of the music itself. In this way, it was objective, it was sachlich. And what all this shows is how ideas and practices are mapped from one cultural domain to another, and it's by virtue of such mappings that meanings are constructed. That means that musical performance is both a local aesthetic practice and an articulation of large cultural values. It is, in short, an indefinitely multi-layered and complex phenomenon, and 
the multiple aspects of it demand multiple analytical perspectives. So, in the last, whoops, are, I hope, it says 50 minutes here, but it wasn't. I hope to have persuaded you that empirical methodologies and cultural interpretation can be productively brought together. Cultural approaches focus on individual experience. Empirical approaches set individual cases into the context of broader trends. Cultural interpretations help to clarify what performances mean, while empirical approaches help to clarify how they mean what they mean. In this way, art and science mutually inform one another. And if we are to understand as complex and intractable a phenomenon as performance enacted under the exacting constraints of real time and constantly poised on the brink of irrationality, then I'd say that we need every analytical weapon in the armory and then some. Thank you. <laughs>